You're viewing a message from the pulpit of Rolling Hills Baptist Church, located in Verona, Pennsylvania. Today is September 21st, 2014. Let us consider how we may spur on one another. Let us consider one another. We are to be about the business of encouraging each other, spurring each other, stirring up each other, stimulating each other to activity. And it's okay to do that and to not wait for somebody to say what to do from here. There's an element here of members of our family, members of the family of Christ, the body of Christ, building each other up, pushing each other, challenging each other, encouraging each other. We can't love somebody else unconditionally alone. We can't love each other selflessly if we are alone. We need one another. You hear that? We need each other. And we need to need each other because we are family. We need to be picked up by our brothers and sisters right here to know that no matter where else we go, no matter what happens, we will always have this family to love us and to support us and to build us up and to love us enough to tell us, you were wrong. I love you, but this wasn't right. I love you, but you're not doing what's right. We need to be a church that prays together. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. We are all a part of this body, of this family. And we all work together because we are all one body part. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and have our bo- having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another, uh, one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The preceding is today's key scripture reference of Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. Here's Corey with part two of a message titled, Action Packed Church. If you're uh, like wondering how scatterbrained and random I am, uh, I'm sitting there with my Bible in my hand, my sermon notes in my hand, and I'm just sitting there listening to the song, just bobbing and weaving. I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta go preach now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sitting there enjoying the great song selection, by the way. I'm sitting there enjoying it, and like, oh yeah, huh? Uh, there's something I'm supposed to be doing right now. <laughs> so, got to love it, right? Um, so, last week, um, we looked at uh, our need as a church to be uh, evangelistic and missional in our very nature. as just a part of our DNA and who we are. And, uh, uh, I mean, honestly, we... we we call ourselves a church, we, we shouldn't even have to say, you know, we're an evangelistic church or, yeah, we're a missional church, a mission-hearted church. I mean, it really should be a redundancy, right? Um, it should be like saying he's a Pittsburgh Steeler Steeler, right? I mean, it's just, it should just become, you're just part of what you, of who we are as a church, that we are uh, evangelistic and missional in our very nature. And so we looked at, uh, at Romans 5, and, uh, and in there in verse uh, 18, uh, Paul said that that Adam's uh, one act, uh, Adam offered or gave one act of defiant disobedience, right? And, and I call it, I say defiant for a reason, right? Uh, it's it's just you know disobedience in the scripture, but the the word for sin that that Paul uses 
is one that describes, um, you know, absolutely saying no, right? And, and God told Adam what? He said, you can have anything in, this, uh, in, in, in the garden here. You can have anything in this paradise except for that one tree, the fruit from that one tree. You can't have it. And what did Adam do? He and Eve said, I know what God said, but we're going to have it anyway, right? Defiance. It was defiant disobedience. And, and that one act of defiant disobedience was redeemed by Christ's one act of righteousness and obedience to the Father for all that would submit to him and his authority and his leadership. I used the uh, New Living Translation last week because it's the only translation that I have or that I've seen um, that words verse 18 in such a way that it says that, you know, Adam's one act brought us brought death, right? His act of disobedience brought death. Jesus' act of righteousness brought us into a right relationship with the Father and offering new life. And that was the, the, really the key that, that, I, that I really like. Most translations, or all the ones that I've seen, just say life. The New Living says new life for us. It's something that's, that is brand new. One of the things I really wanted us to grasp last week is that we're not to hold on to this new life. The life that is given, the justification that is given to us is not for us to hold on to, right? It's not like a birthday present. Somebody gives you something for your birthday, it's for you, right? Somebody gives you a gift, it's for you, usually. You know, if, you get a, if I get a shirt for my birthday, well, you know, I love Dave Goldstein, but I, I'm not going to say, hey, Dave, you want to wear my shirt this week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my shirt, Dave. <laughs> I need I need it. I love it, right? You should see the look on his face right now. It's priceless. It? But you know, but when when Christ offered us new life, when we have the gift of salvation, it's not for us to keep. It's not for us to hang on to. If you remember, I even stated that that it's my belief that the life or the new life that we have, it's not even, a, it's not even about us anymore, right? When Paul says that there's new life for everyone, that, that as children of God, as his chosen, as followers of Christ, that no longer is about us. We have it already. The passage is a very evangelistic passage. It, 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 places for us the call, the command, I believe, to go and to go out and to make disciples, right? Not to sit in and invite them in so that we can then make them, but to go out or to sit in and wait, but to go out and make disciples, to be witnesses, to be ministers of reconciliation, to be God's royal ambassadors. It is his command that we are to be a living and a verbal testimony to the power of Jesus Christ. And it's not, I believe it's scriptural that it's not one or the other, or a little bit of one and a lot of the other. We're not called to just be a living testimony, right? Jesus doesn't just say, live a good life so that they'll know. We're, we're not supposed to just be a verbal testimony either. What good is it to, to say, to have all the right words, to have all the right uh, uh, comments to have all the right answers to the questions if our very lives don't demonstrate the power of Christ living in us and the change that he brings about in us. We are called to be a living and a verbal testimony to Jesus Christ, to the world around us. And if it's not going to be us, then who's it going to be? If we're not going to share, then who will? Oh, the next guy will. Or that other church, they're really evangelistic. We'll be the discipleship church. That's an easy cop-out, right? If not us, then who? Romans uh, chapter 10, starting in verse 13, says, Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a quote from Joel. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And here's another quote from the Old Testament. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Paul says it right here. How can they believe in the one in whom they've not heard of? 
And how can they hear if someone is not there to preach or to teach, to show them? It's got to be a necessary part of our DNA and a necessary part of who we are. If we are not missional and evangelistic in our nature as a church, then I have to say that we are very lacking as a church. Some would even posit that we're not even a church anymore. If that's not a part of who we are, it's part of the very definition of what a church is and does. If we're not engaging the lost and the sick and the hurting and the bleeding and the, and the, the mournful, if we're not the, the grieving, if we're not engaging these people and if we're not uh, uh, making an impact in their, their lives, then we are lacking. You've probably heard the old cliche about a church should look like a spiritual hospital. It's okay if we look like a hospital. All right, and I'm not talking about the nice, clean, new UPMC over here in Monroeville. I'm talking about the MASH unit on the battlefield, the nasty one with all the bacteria and vermin crawling around. That's what we are supposed to look like. Not all cleaned up, nice and pretty and shiny. We are called to be a MASH unit, not a country club, not a social club. And all of that is very true, and I believe all of that is very biblical. Yet, can I, can I be bold enough this morning to say that I also believe that we need to get things right, right here, within this family? Players, I'll use the NFL for example, because now we're in the football season. Players in the NFL, for instance, they get banged up, right? They get injured, they get hurt, and they have to take time away from the game. They can't play. You know, maybe they have a concussion or, you know, there's something wrong with a shoulder, knee, elbow, ankle, you know, any joint, ligaments or tendons or muscles that are torn or sprained or strained or pulled. Any number of injuries can happen to make a player have to miss a ball game. And yet that player never loses his identity, but what does he have to do? If he's going to be any use to his team at all, what does he need to do? He needs to heal. He needs to strengthen. He needs to go and camp out, and the personal trainer, personal training staff then becomes his new best friends, right? He has to go there. He needs his body to recuperate. Because why? What is his ultimate goal? What has he got in front of him? I've got to get back on the field. I need to take care of my body and heal my body so that when the time comes that I can get back on that field, I am able to accomplish the duties and responsibilities set before me by my coaching staff. He does his staff and his teammates no good. And then he gets fussed at by the fans, right? If he goes out there with a bum knee and he can't run or cut or do whatever he needs to do to make the plays that he needs to make the to, to, for his team to be successful. I think we're kind of in the same boat right now. We're, we're a very different church than, than who we were in July of 2011. I, I don't even think we resemble the same church. And we've, we've grown. We've made strides. We have seen God walk with us through some tough times, some stressful times, as I talked about last week. Just, you ever sit back and, and see God's handiwork? Sometimes you go through a situation and you're like, where is God right now? And then you look back and you say, oh, there he was. God has walked with us. But I still believe that we are a church who is hurting and we are a church who needs to get ourselves healthy. I believe that just like the NFL player who's injured, we need to keep our eyes on who we are supposed to be and strive for those goals to accomplish and work towards the goal to accomplish who we're supposed to be so that we can fulfill our role but also believe that we are a church who needs to spend time in the trainer's room. 
We need to care for ourselves. We need to heal. We need to regain strength. We need to prepare ourselves spiritually to get back out on the field. We need to prepare ourselves to get back out on the battlefield. Because it's really not a playing field. It's not a game, right? We have been commissioned by our Creator to fight the war. And it is a dirty, dirty spiritual war. Miss Cindy is our uh, missions coordinator. And she and I have, have talked several times over the last 19 months during this interim period. And, and we've made the comment to each other, right, Miss Cindy, that, uh, that we, need, we are a church that needs to, to take care of ourselves. And we need to get things right here if we're ever going to be, if we're ever going to effectively make an impact in the community around us and in the state around us and in the nation around us and in the world around us. Greg sat in on our deacons meeting last Sunday and he said pretty much the same thing. That we need to heal internally. Jimmy, can you throw up that logo for me? What do you see when you see that logo? What do you see? Stars pointing outward, okay. Anything else? Arrows pointing inward. Yeah, I didn't come up with that. I wish I had. This is an old, like from the 70s, Baptist Student Union, now known as Baptist Collegiate Ministry logo. Some BCMs uh, still use it, but it has the five arrows pointing out, and then the five arrows pointing in. You see, last week I, I preached on the arrows that are pointing out. Today I want to preach on the arrows that are pointing inward. We, we need balance. I talked about balance last week. I talked about how it's necessary in our personal lives to have balance, just like it's necessary for us to have balance as a church family. There must reside a balance for us, a lot like this logo. There's a balance between the outreach and the inreach, where we minister to the needs of the community and the world around us, being living and verbal testimonies for Jesus Christ. But then there needs to be the balance of the inward arrows where we take a look at who we are and address who we are as a church family and heal and strengthen so that when we go to the out arrows that we're able to do so effectively. So go ahead, if you will, and turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. We can go from our need to making an impact outside of these walls to our need to make an impact inside of these walls. I'm going to start in verse 22, read through verse 25. Verses 24 and 25 are going to be our, our primary passages this morning. The author of Hebrews says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and have our bo having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one, other, uh, one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the author of Hebrews uh, which we don't really know who he is. A lot of people think it's Paul. A lot of people don't think it's Paul. It doesn't really matter at this point. But, but he gives us three encouragements, three urgings. I urge you these three things, starting 
uh, in, in verse 22. And these, these three urgings, these three encouragements, if you will, are grounded in the fact that when we meditate on Christ, when we meditate on who He is and what He has done, it should spur us on to activity. It should make us move, right? You know what a spur is. You guys know, everybody knows what a spur is, right? Does anybody not know? I mean, it's, you know, horse riders. You know, you think about the old cowboy movies. They walk around, and when the boys, the boys go, ching, 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 because the spurs rattle as they, as they walk. You know, they wear them on their boots, and, and they hop on the horse, and that horse doesn't go anywhere. He's like, yeah, he doesn't go. And so what do they do? They kick him right here with those spurs. And it makes the horse go, Woo! <laughs> and there he goes. All right, I'll do what you want, whatever. Y'all let you want to see that? I'm sorry. Fool for Christ, right? And so a spur moves a horse to action. When we meditate on Christ, when we meditate on the Bible, when we meditate on who Jesus is and what he's done, it should move us to action, not to inactivity. So the first one that the author offers us in verse 22 is, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. All right, so uh, 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 the urging, uh, the meditation on Christ leads us to, to drawing close to him, right? To wanting to be near him. The more we learn about who Christ is and the more we see him work in our lives, the more we want to be near him. The second in verse 23 is to, to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. And so we say that we have this hope in Christ. And so the more that we get to know him, the more that we see him work, the more we hold to that hope that we have. And it becomes a steadfast, firm hold. And then there's the third one that I want to focus our attention on this morning. He says, let us consider how we may spur on one another. Let us consider one another. He's speaking here of a mutual, reciprocated activity, right? This is one in which believers encourage each other, right? It's, it's not where a leader stands and directs them what to do. It's not uh, me standing here and saying, we should do this. And you go, okay, well, let's go do that. Or Greg standing up here in a couple of weeks and saying, this is what we should do. Or Nathan in the times that he stood here saying, this is what God's word says that we're to do. Or Kirk when he's preached. Or whoever is preaching this pulpit saying, this is what we're supposed to do. And we go, okay, well, let's do that. It's not about one person standing here directing everybody about what they should do. That's not the intent of the author. He's speaking to the believers. And he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on. We are to be about the business of encouraging each other, spurring each other, stirring up each other, stimulating each other to activity. And it's okay to do that and to not wait for somebody to say what to do from here. And let's be honest, that's kind of hard for us, right? Because it had been a habit for a long time. I was uh, approached by um, one of our members last week, and he handed me a piece of paper uh, that had some stuff he had, some notes he had written down on it about our mutual need for each other. And one of the things that he wrote there was that I need to need the rest of the body. And I found that to be very profound. That I need to need. We need each other. I preached a whole sermon on it back during the summer. We need one another. We need to spur each other on, to encourage each other. The, the, the Greek word here for spur is to incite or to provoke. That's why I love the, the translation of spur. <laughs> A spur provokes a horse to go, right? It means to incite, to provoke. It's not something that's comfortable, but it's something that needs to be done. 
And so there's an element here of members of our family, members of the family of Christ, the body of Christ, building each other up, pushing each other, challenging each other, encouraging each other. Our, our softball team, uh, I run the softball team, and one of the things that I tell our guys every year is we need to encourage each other. I don't, yeah, we all want to win, right? It stinks when we lose. It really stinks when we lose a game we shouldn't lose, right? I mean, and as a, man, a team full of guys, we are very much concerned with the end score and the outcome, right? But softball is just supposed to be a fun recreational game. And if we can't have fun, then why even play? And so I tell our guys, we need to build each other up. We might be getting our heads handed to us 20 to 2 in the fourth inning, but we need to encourage the guys that walk off the field. Slap their hands. Slap their backs. Slap them on the rear, whatever it takes, to say, hey, pick your head up. Chin up. Right? We encourage each other, build each other up. That's what we are to do, to spur each other on. And we're supposed to spur each other or provoke each other towards what? What does the author say? Toward love and good deeds. So we're to provoke one another to love. Love means a lot of things these days, doesn't it? Man, I love five guys. Mm, that burger... Whew. There's nothing like a good grease burger. Right? It is not good for me at all. I know that every time I eat one of those, it takes a year off my life. Man. And Amy hears that I ate at Five Guys. She's like, well, it marks one off on the life insurance policy. Right? There's another year gone. I love Five Guys burgers. But you see in that statement how we water down the very word. I don't love Five Guys burgers. I really like them. They taste good to me. That bacon double cheeseburger with some salt on the. Oh, man. Woo, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Everybody's like, shut up. Still got an hour till lunch. I didn't tell you it was just as a, like a dual sermon. It's going to be like a two hour sermon. <laughs> Somebody's going to be taking orders. <laughs> Fox's Pizza is going to walk in through the front doors there. Five guys. Oh, yeah, yeah we go to five. We get, we'll call in order five guys, see if they deliver. But we have really watered down that word love. We can say we love just about anything. There were specific words for love, how we translate love in, uh, in the Greek language. Uh, one of them was uh, eros, a romantic love. That's not the word that's used here. <laughs> that's a really good thing, right? <laughs> that's not the word for love here. There is uh, the love of friendship, right? Close friendship, almost a, a brotherhood of sorts, philia. You know, city of Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Is, a, is there a more uh, undeserved name for a city ever? <laughs> should be like the anti-Philadelphia, you know, should name it a Philadelphia, right? So it's not philia. There's a, another Greek word that we don't see in Scripture, uh, which is more of a familial love. It's called, it's a, the, the Greek word storge. And, uh, but the word we have here says we're to spur one another on towards love. The author's saying we're to spur one another on toward agape. Agape love is a selfless love. It is a self-sacrificial, unconditional love. It, is, uh, it doesn't expect anything in return, right? Agape love says, I love you, and I don't care if you return that love back to me. I love you. I don't care if you don't love me back. I will still love you. I don't care if you hate me and curse me. I will still love you with no intent of self-benefit. Does that sound familiar? It's the word the Bible uses to show God's unconditional love for us. I said last week that if, uh, you know, that God doesn't see us the way we see ourselves or the way we see each other. 
we see our flaws and you know we you know I, I see my own failures and you know that's why the song that was up earlier is so powerful you know who am i that you would love me you know but you call me your own you call me your chosen you're unashamed of me you know that's how god sees us because he doesn't see that what does he see or who does he see he sees jesus christ he sees the work of his son in us he sees the replacement the the sacrifice the penance of our sin in Jesus Christ. And I stated that if God sees Christ when he looks at us, then he's going to have the same expectations of us that he had of Christ. There's a lot of weight to that, right? So if God looks at me and sees Jesus, then he's going to have the same expectation of me that he has of Jesus because that's who he sees. If he has the same expectations of me that he has of Christ, then that includes the love that he expects us to show to one another. He expects us to love each other unconditionally. He says, Spirit inspired this and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward unconditional, selfless, self-sacrificial, not expecting anything in return, love. Have you, that's not church-like, right? <laughs> because we're people. That is a difficult form of love for us. We have very conditional love right? Very conditional. But Jesus said in John 13, how did he say that people would know, that the world outside would know that we're his disciples? Our love for one another. The word there for love is agape, or a form of agape as well. Jesus says, don't know you mine, if you love each other unconditionally, selflessly. We as believers are to help each other, right? He says, let us provoke each other. Let us uh, spur one another, stir it up. Let us move each other, encourage each other toward this kind of love. And that is a difficult, difficult task to do because we're all different. We all have our own ideas and thoughts and things that we like and don't like, and we're people and we're sinful and we're selfish, right? The idea of a selfless love is a very difficult concept because we are not selfless by nature. That's who we were created to be. We were created to be selfless. But then sin came in. That defiance came in. So the Bible encourages us here in Hebrews 10. Spur one another towards love, towards agape. And not just to love, but also to good deeds. The expectation is that the saving work of Christ in our lives will lead to good works in his followers, right? James said that uh, faith without works is dead in chapter 2. He said a chapter earlier, that we are to be doers of the word and not just hearers. He said, don't just listen to it, do it. It doesn't do any good if you listen without doing. Being doers of the word means going outside of these walls and making disciples. It means being a witness. It means being an ambassador. It means being ministers. But it also means looking within and taking care of ourselves and each other within. If we can't get the agape love part right within the body, within this family, then what good are we really doing to go outside the walls then? Balance. Finding that balance. Verse 25, the author says that we are not to give up meeting together, or some translations say forsake our assembling together. 
says, Let us not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting here that there's this conjunction of love, spurring each other on to love, and meeting together. Love and good deeds and meeting together. Makes me think that there's something to that. Right? We need each other for that. People might be able to practice their faith by themselves. Read the Bible, pray, listen to some worship songs. You know, They might have hope on their own. They may, never, they may have, hold unswervingly to the hope that they profess alone. But what can we not do alone? We can't love somebody else unconditionally alone. We can't love each other selflessly if we are alone. We need one another. You hear that? We need each other. And we need to need each other because we are family. We are brothers and sisters. I tell my kids, all the time, because, well, you heard the boys as they walked out the door, right? I tell them, when it boils down to it, you got family. When everybody else turns their back on you, you've got family. And you better invest in that family. Because one day, that's going to be all you have. Can I tell us something, Rolling Hills? We have each other. And we need each other. And can I tell you something? I need you. I need you. I need you to love me. I need you to encourage me. I need you to push me. I need you to challenge me. To not let me be content or satisfied with who I am in Christ. I need that. And I am not alone in this room. There are going to be days when the world crashes down around us and even our own blood will turn their backs. And what we need is our family. We need to be picked up by our brothers and sisters right here to know that no matter where else we go, no matter what happens, we will always have this family to love us and to support us, and to build us up, and to love us enough to tell us, you were wrong. I love you, but this wasn't right. I love you, but you're not doing what's right. That's part of the process, part of the equation. Agape love is a product of an active community of believers and a family that does not give up or forsake meeting together. The author here urges them to not give it up as some are in the habit of doing. And one of the things that we don't know is who the some were, right? There's nothing in the, in the original language that is specific about who the some were. We don't know if it was exclusive of his readership. We don't know if it was inclusive of his readership. We just don't know. It's possible that it was either way. Look around the room this morning. Go ahead. It's okay. You can turn your heads. Look. Look. I want you to look. Look at each other. (laughs) We have fewer today than when we started this process in February of 2013. And, And I'm not calling out those who are no longer here. So please don't hear that. Because honestly, it's not about them. It's not about that. The cry here, the cry from Scripture, is for those of us who remain to not turn our backs on meeting with each other, on assembling together, on loving together. We need one another, and it has nothing to do with the fact that we are fewer in number. Zero to do with that. We can have every seat in this room filled, and we would still desperately need each other. 
We were put here together to support each other, to encourage each other, to rebuke each other, to teach or instruct each other, to train, to help one another, to help us flee from godlessness and to pursue righteousness. Sometimes our attitude is, well, that's their life and that's their choice and I don't agree with it, but I'm not going to tell them because I don't want to butt into their business. Is that how you work with your family at home? I've said it before. Blood's thicker than water, right? Well, the blood of Christ is thicker than the blood that runs in these veins right now. You are my family. And it hurts and it stings and we don't like it, but sometimes you have to go to your brother or your sister and say, this isn't biblical. Right? We're supposed to help each other. Help each other persevere. The author here then states that our reasoning for assembling is to encourage one another. And the word for encourage is perikaleo. And it means a couple of different things. One meaning is to call or to summon to one's side. That is an amazing picture to me. You know what it says? The image that I get in my head is two people on a journey together. Actually, you know what really comes to my mind? <laughs> Anybody ever seen Lord of the Rings? Yeah, it is a, you know, uh, Frodo and Sam, you know, and, and their journey together, right? And they get Merry and Pippin for a little while, and then they have the Fellowship of the Ring, but ultimately it's Sam and Frodo. And they come alongside of each other, and they walk together and journey together, and they go through some stuff together. But part of the meaning of this is to call to one side, to say, hey, come walk with me. Let's, let's walk together. Let's journey together. Another meaning is to speak in such a way as to do some of the things that I mentioned earlier, support and rebuke and correct and teaching. It means to encourage, to comfort or console, to instruct, to strengthen, to admonish, Right? Modish is to advise against something, but to do it in a gentle manner. That's why when we see our brother or sister doing something they shouldn't be doing or whatever, if we are led by the Spirit, right? Don't just go off half cocked to somebody saying, You were wrong! Heathen! Right? It's to go with the gentle Spirit one of love, led by the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit, to say, hey, this is what I see. And to not get upset when they go, oh yeah, well, what about the log in your eye? You know what Jesus said, right? I got a speck here. You got a log poking out of yours. It's part of our call, part of our, our duty with one another. And so one of your questions might be, well, how do we accomplish this? And I think that's a great question that we should leave up to Greg. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, yes. It took about a half second for everybody to catch on to that. <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I hope not. No, I'm just kidding. I know that one answer to this is that we cannot be just a Sunday morning church, right? We, we can't, I mean, we can't just come in here for an hour and a half once a week and expect to be family, right? When the author says to not, uh, of uh, to not give up meeting together or forsake assembling together. He's not talking about just on Sunday morning, church, right? I really believe that this is, it's, it's more than that. There's, you know, we, we, we need Bible studies on Sunday mornings. 
for our kids, for us, time together where we go through Scripture and we teach and we learn, life groups, praying together. Right? We need these things. We need to be more than just this. Right? We need more than just what we have at the moment. And so what I would like to offer is a list of six things that we should all be involved here at Rolling Hills. And this is not in any particular order. All right? One is prayer. A family that prays together stays together, right? I also believe a family that plays together stays together. So we should pray and play together, right? We should have fun together. That comes later. It's the fellowship part. But we need to be a church that prays together. There's a certain vulnerability that comes when you kneel before the Father with another brother or sister in Christ. You want to bond as a, as a church and as a family? Then we need to pray together. Because there's where you hear someone's heart. You know, I've, some people are worried about, well, I, I, I don't pray very good. I don't have the right words. You know, I sound kind of like, when I pray. And then you have the guys with the words that are that long, with the King James language mixed in, you know, and they sound so profound and intelligent. Can I tell you something? I think the most profound prayers I've ever heard in my life come from the guys who sound like, uh, you know why? There's no pretense. They speak from the heart. God, this is my heart. Here's what it is. Instead of babbling on like fools, as the Bible says, many words think they'll be heard because of their many words, right? We need to pray to, with one another. I don't care what you sound like or how good you think you are at praying. You know what? It's not a competition. God doesn't really care how good you think you are at praying. God doesn't hear the eloquent words or the broken language. He hears your heart. A second one is worship. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. See, we got worship all mixed up, right? We think that what we did earlier was worship. And it was. It's part of worship. It's part of what worship is. The, the singing of praises and lifting of our voices to the Father, to the one who created us, in praise and adoration and glory to him. But that's not all it is. Because worship isn't the words that come out of our mouth. Worship is not the words that come up on a screen. Worship is not standing up and singing four songs and shaking some hands and taking an offering and listening to a sermon. Worship is done in spirit and in truth because it is about who you are and where your heart is. It is a sacrifice of self. It is a spiritual act. The spiritual act of worship manifests itself in the physical acts of singing and playing music, praying and reading. Right? Right? But you can do those things and not be worshiping one iota. But I believe that we are to engage in true, genuine, biblical worship together. And that is opening our hearts before the Lord together as one. I heard somebody say years ago, and I love the way that he said it. He said, worship is taking your breastbone splitting it in half, pulling your ribs apart and bearing all that you are to God and saying, here I am. 
this is who I am and this is what I offer you. Exposing ourselves. A third one is study of the Bible. My favorite chapter in all the Bible is Joshua 1. Greg read from it a couple of weeks ago. In that, uh, verses 7, Joshua 1, 7 and 8, God tells Joshua, he says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Study of the Word, meditation of the Word, knowledge of the Word, understanding of the Word, and being able to do that together corporately as one. Here, this time together should be a form of Bible study, right? We should be looking at this book right here. You know what I've prayed every week for the last 19 months? That you guys wouldn't hear a word that I say, but that you would hear this. Quite frankly, God's Word doesn't need me to speak for it. It speaks for itself. I've said it many times before. I don't care. I mean, I used to care. I don't care anymore. The style of a preacher, how he sounds when he gets up, how dynamic is he, how engaging is he. Does his voice rise and fall? That was rise and fall. That would be better, right? That would be more. <laughs> that would be rise and rise, right? I don't care if his jokes are awesome. I don't care if he pulls me in with his words. You know what I care about? Does he preach this? Does he stand on this? Is his heart each and every week that this is what is heard and taught and taught with faithfulness, with glory to given to God? I'll say it. Some preachers are more dynamic than others. They just are. What matters is what they stand on. And if they stand on the Word and they teach the Word, then how they do it really shouldn't matter because the Spirit will speak through His Word. Right? And if He is speaking through His Word, and your heart is right and ready to hear it, then it doesn't matter what He sounds like, because what you want to hear is the voice of the Lord speaking into you. It doesn't matter how boring He might be. Is He preaching the Word? Kind of went down a rabbit trail there. I apologize. I'm just defending myself. <laughs> right? But we need Bible study here. We need Bible study in smaller groups. We need, like I said earlier, groups on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and maybe meeting in people's homes throughout the week, sitting down and studying Scripture together, opening up the Word and saying, you know, this is what God's Word teaches. How does it impact me? How do I apply this? How do we do this together? What impact does this have on us? And answering any other multitude of questions that there might be, Studying God's Word together as a body, corporately, whether in a big group or small groups. A fourth one is discipleship. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Four generations of discipleship there, right? Paul says, And the things you have heard me say, so there's Paul speaking, Timothy hearing Paul, right, from Paul to Timothy. Entrust to reliable men, third generation, from Timothy to the reliable men, who will also be qualified to teach others, going the fourth generation, from the reliable men to the others. And Paul doesn't mean once you're done with the four generations, you're good. The expectation here is that it continues. That it's going from one to another to another to another to another. It is believers discipling one another. It is disciple makers making more disciples. Can I ask you a question? 
Who are you investing yourself in? Is your cup filling up and just filling up? Or are you pouring yourself into anybody else? Are you investing your life into anybody else? Are you discipling anyone? Are you being discipled? Is there somebody that is a more mature believer in Christ who is pouring him or herself into your life? I'll just be honest with you. If I wasn't a campus minister, I'd have to say no to both of them probably. I can tell you no, that I have nobody pouring into me. Do we have someone investing in us, in you, in me, so that we can then invest in others? And that's kind of a toe-stepping one, right? Oh, now you're meddling. You're getting in my business now. Okay. Then I pray that what you've heard is the Spirit and not me, because God's Word is actually what's stepping on your toes. I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot me, right? I believe the Bible teaches us that we are to disciple others. It's part of who we are. It's got to be a part of who we are. You cannot do this alone. You cannot do this without someone else. You cannot walk this walk of the the Christian life and journey alone by yourself without somebody else saying, here, let me pour into you. And then shame on us. Shame on us. If we can't take what the Spirit is giving and then invest that into somebody else's life. It's part of our mandate. Two more really quickly. Fellowship. Acts 42 through 47. Acts 2, 42 through 47. Says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonder, uh, wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone who or to anyone as he had in need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word for fellowship here in verse 42 is the word koinonia. And it means being associated with each other, participating together, sharing life together, intimacy together. Right? Being a community Fellowship is us living life together. It's eating together, working together, playing together. That's why I love the, you know, the, the Idlewild Church Day. There was a bunch of us that, that went and we, we picnicked together and we were all there. And, you know, we weren't always at the table at the, same, at the same time. We didn't all go to all the same rides at the same time. But we were there together. And we need those times. We need that. We need fellowship just as much as we need to study the Word or the worship together or to pray together or to disciple each other. We need these things. We need to live life together, to invite each other into our homes. Say, hey, why don't you come over for dinner? You know, if you worked it right, you know, you could just have one meal a week that you have to cook or something like that, right? Just have like a rotation Every night of the week? Just an idea. And then the last one is a very churchy word. I hate churchy words, but I can't think of a better word than this. This is an old Southern Baptist term. Churchmanship. I, that, that, I, that one got dug out of the coffers, let me tell you. I'm just not is smart enough to think of a different word for it. But basically what it means is being involved in the life of in the ministry of the body of Christ, the church. Basically, what it means is don't be a, a pew sitter or a chair warmer. Don't come on Sunday mornings and warm up a chair and be done. Think you put in your good deed for the week. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13 say, The body is a unit. 
though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. You go down, this whole section is about uh, all the body parts working together. And in verse 27, he says, You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We are all a part of this body, of this family. And can I, can I tell you something? As I look around who we have left, this is our core. This is our core group, right? 19 months has taken us to our core. I can look around and I can confidently say that I don't see anybody who is just a chair warmer. And that's not what we're called to be. It is incumbent upon us then to encourage that atmosphere as more people we hope, we expect to come and to be a part of our body. Yeah, there are some who do a whole lot. And there are some who do a little. But we all work together because we are all one body part. My heart does a whole lot more than my pinky nail does. Right? My pinky nail's there for a reason. I'm not really sure why. But I do know if it was gone, it probably wouldn't be a good thing and I wouldn't like it. But I know that my heart is the one that does the work to keep me alive. Both are different body parts, but part of the same body, fulfilling their roles. We need each other. Because we need to heal this family. We need to be in the trainer's room, working to get ready with the goal in front of us, this is who we are now. This is where we are. And this is what we've got to do for the time being. But understand, we understand that this isn't all we are called to be. That we know that we are, are getting ourselves ready to get back out onto the battlefield. To go and do and fulfill our role. To do what we are called to do. To be a mass unit. And you know what? It's okay if we're not pretty. It's okay if we're hurting a little bit right now. It's okay if we've got work to do. Can I tell you something? If we were sitting here thinking we had nothing, no work to do and nothing that we needed to accomplish and that we were all fine and dandy and good just the way we are, I'd walk out the doors this morning and leave and not come back. Because I never want to be a part of a church that says, we're good. We have got it all down pat. Because that is a church in denial. So can I tell you, it's okay that we recognize that we have work to do. It's okay to sit back and say, we're not there yet. But it's not okay to sit there and say, well, let's just focus on this and this alone because we focus and we work towards this with the goal of that. Fix now to move forward. And then one day we're going to come back and we're going to have to come back to the trainer's room, right? Some, play, some guys in football are just injury prone. They are always in the training room, right? Sometimes that's just going to happen. We're going to go out there, we're going to play, we're going to get injured and wounded, we're going to have to come back, we're going to have to fix what's here. We're going to have to sit in the training room and be stretched out a little bit and the trainer's going to work on us and hurt. And we're going to rehab and then we're going to go right back out there because we know who we are and where we're supposed to be. Let's pray. Father, you demonstrate for us in your word a need to look outward, but also a need to look inward. And there's always that balance. 
Sometimes we have a hard time finding that balance. Father, I pray that as we prepare for Greg to come and to be our sheepdog, that you will, by your Spirit, begin to reveal to us and open our eyes up to who we are and what we need to work on as a church, as a family. Father, we can't see it for ourselves, right? It's kind of the, the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. Well, we're, we're right in the middle of the forest. And all we see are the trees around us. And we need you to show us where we are, where we're lacking, what we need to work on, what we need your help with, and that you will push us to heal those areas, relying on you to do the healing. I pray that we would never focus on ourselves, that we would never, uh, and not to focus on ourselves in such a way as to think that we can do this, Oh, well, we have this thing that we need to fix over here, so here's, you know, A, B, and C of how we do this. You know, okay, let's go to it. But that we would be shown by your Spirit, hey, this is what you need to work on. And that at that point we would fall before your throne and say, then you have to fix it for us. And God, I pray that in time, that through Greg and through our leadership and through everybody in this room right now, it's not just one person or a few people, it is all of us together, that we would find that balance between outside the walls of the church, outside the family, reaching out, being the living and the verbal image of Christ. Balance between that and taking care of ourselves, being a family, assembling together to pray and to worship, to study your word, to disciple each other, to be active in the church, to play together, to pray together. The bottom line is that this Rolling Hills Baptist Church, as we call it, does not belong to us. Pray that we would never think that it does. And help us to never be content with who we are, but to be constantly pushing forward, pursuing you and your desire for us. We love you and pray these things. In the name of Jesus Christ who saves us. Visit us on the web at www.rhbcpitpitt.com or drop in for a visit at 120 Gurnert Drive, Verona, PA, 15147. Service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday. Send us a message via email to Rolling Hills Baptist at comcast.net or reach us by phone at 412-795-1133.